five. Okay, which is a good amount of material, leading us tomorrow to just review six and seven again. Six and seven is pretty recent material, so that's the stuff that was on your last test. So again, we'll save that for tomorrow's class, but today we're going to go from two all the way through five. So this is a lot of stuff. Okay. This is test, yeah, pretty much test one, two, three, four, and part of five. And then tomorrow we'll pick up with part of test five and, and all test six. Okay? Um, I can do this two ways. First, if there's specific questions that you have, I'd like to take those first, maybe make a list of them on this whiteboard, and go through those topics one at a time. And then at the end, I just need to get a marker, actually, that's what I was looking for. And then at the end, what we'll do is simply take a look and say, all right, let's go over some other topics that maybe we haven't hit on yet. Okay? Olivia, give me one second. I'm going to be the first one to go. Let me find a marker. Joseph, hang on one second.
Um, all right, so let's start with the first thing on the top there. So we'll start with mu. So examples that you have to do with mu. Make some points. Mu, <laughs> mu is the coefficient, okay, the coefficient of friction between two types of mu, if you remember. Okay, there's the mu of kinetic friction and the mu of static friction. Well, the force has to do with it, and we'll remember that our force of friction is equal to mu times the normal force. That's where our formula comes into play. Okay? So what we'll notice is that the mu value is always based on the force that's being applied, or frictional force, and the normal force itself. And the normal force itself. Stop. Is the um, force of mu given as a formula? Yeah. Look at your formula sheet. The cumulative formula sheet on the top. That's the shelter T equals plus B. Now, there's a thing we should notice, remember, that it's tougher to get something moving than to keep it moving. Remember we talked about this? To break that force initially is tougher than to keep an object in motion. So what we say is that the mu value of static is always going to be bigger than the mu, or greater than or equal to the mu value of kinetic. Okay, so again, static friction, static friction is tougher to work against that kinetic. So UK less than or equal to US. So the kinetic the kinetic value is going to be less than US because static is tougher to break than kinetic. So with the question like that could be like a that would be like if you theoretically speak, that would be like a part two kind of question like you know discuss the difference between the static friction force and the kinetic friction force. What's Q? And the relationship between the two. So that's actually one of my questions. Well, that's if the coefficient of friction between metal and wood is 0.5, then the coefficient uh, of static. So it would have to be the answer that is higher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The only one that was higher is the choice. Okay? So that covers one of those. Good job. No, I just couldn't read the question. Sorry, it's a coefficient. Yeah. All right, so what I want to do really is take a look at, first of all, any questions on what mu is, what it actually is? If a higher mu value is apparent, what would that mean? It's higher than mu. Exactly. It's harder to move. Again, mu is really a characteristic of the surfaces in contact. So if you have ice and metal, like ice skates, very low mu. If I have like sandpaper on concrete, that would be tough to move, wouldn't it? <coughs> That's a very high mu value. So the higher the mu gets, the more friction you get, you kind of feel. Okay, Jack? So when it asks for like the kinetic friction, that's when you solve for mu in a, in a problem. So it's Where it's like, moving, correct. So like what's the, it would be like, so it would be like, what's the kinetic friction? What's the, what's the units? It would say, there are no units for mu. And the reason you can remember that is this. Solve for mu here. Wouldn't you divide by Fn? Yeah. And what's a force over a force? It's a newton over a newton. So the units cancel, right? Okay. So mu is unitless. Okay, that's a good thing to notice. He's right. Mu is unitless always. And you, well, you're going to use F equals MG, but that's not where that comes from. But you will use F equals MG in that formula. Wait, what do you mean by unit? There's no units on it. Right. You know how like force is units of newtons, velocities, meters per second, mass is kilograms? Okay. okay. <laughs> Remind me tomorrow, what I want to do tomorrow is look at every, um, well, let's do it right now. Before we get into, I'm going to do an example of mu right now. But let's, before we get into mu, let's list all of our variables that we've done this year and list the units so we're all clear. First, mass is measured in? <laughs> Velocity measured in? Acceleration? Okay. Next, this, now remember, velocity and speed have the same units. So I can write them together. Just like the next one I'm going to write is distance and displacement, which is measured in? Meters. Okay. These are more basic ones from like chapter 
two and three mainly, where we had mass and then projectiles moving. In chapter four, we talked about forces. Good. And they're in newtons. Speed slash velocity acceleration. Wait, what? Acceleration. 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 Oh, oh. Now, coefficient of friction. Has no units. I'm just going to put unit in this. A unit in this. Coefficient of friction is unit. This is N for forces. What's the chemistry behind it? Energy. Energy. Now, energy is a tough one to remember. Not to remember, but notice that there are so many of them. It's joules, yes. But remember, for energy, you should list the subcategories now. Potential energy, kinetic energy, work. The type of energy? Power. All of these have units of joules. Be careful with power. Power is not joules, but watts. And I'm going to write the word out so we remember that it's not work for W, but it's watts. Okay, watts for power. Uh, K value is the spring value. Okay, the spring stiffness K. Its units are newtons per meter. Oh, I should write that one. Okay. Newtons. That's a newton. <laughs> that's a newton per meter. <laughs> Anything else? Anything else? Oh, um, what's that? Uh, meter, kilogram, meter per second. Oh, that's momentum. Momentum. Okay. Momentum. okay. <laughs> Moment. What does K stand for? Yeah. The spring constant. Slash, there's that question. Uh, so it should be new slash. It should be. Okay. Stop. Stop. The higher the K value, Remember, the stronger the spring. A low K value would be like a K value for a spring that's inside of your pen. Okay? Now, yeah, the other question was good. Uh, momentum. And momentum is one that people seem to always forget. But if you remember the formula for momentum, you have units. Momentum is P and equals MV. So mass is kilogram. Velocity is meters per second. So those are the units for momentum. Kilograms, meters per second. Okay, kg, m over s. K is the spring constant, P is momentum. That's pretty much all the units that we went through. Uh, let me think, is there anything else? I don't think so. Yeah, we're going to do that for sure. I just wanted to stop and make sure we're all clear. Okay, so we have our units. Let's go back to mu now. Let's take a look at some examples. All right. Let's say. An object moves with an acceleration of 3 meters per second squared. <coughs> and its mass, guys, relax. Chat, lower. And its mass is 5 kilograms. An object moves with an acceleration of 3 meters per second squared, and its mass is 5 kilograms. If the, if the applied force, and this is where I'm going to combine, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to combine forces at angles and, and mu at the same time, so you can see how they can actually be related, because they're always going to be like this, they're going to be combined. If the applied force is 20 newtons at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal, then find Find the coefficient of kinetic friction. Find UK. Okay, the coefficient of kinetic friction. <laughs> <laughs> the formulas that you're given, I can find it on Moodle, guys. Please take a look. I'm going to give you the same 
sheet that's on Moodle has a form of the sheet. So you have your test. I'm going to go over the format tomorrow, the whole test. So remind tomorrow and I'll go over it. All right, let's get into this now.
MA is always what we're going to have when we add up the forces. But because there's no vertical motion in this problem, we simply put zero here. That's because you're going to have really, this is M times AY, but there is no acceleration. Don't confuse this with projectile motion, where the vertical acceleration is negative 9.81. Okay, again, there is no vertical acceleration. The negative 9.8 will come into play right here when we look at FG later. Okay, we're not worried about it right now because there is no AY. Mom. Say there's there is, but the acceleration we were given the problem said there was horizontal acceleration. What did I write in the beginning? Read the words in the beginning. Maybe I didn't say it correctly. Um, an object moves with an acceleration of three meters per second and its mass is five. Okay, sorry. So to specify, let's add to that problem to the right. An object moves with an acceleration of three meters per second to the right. Three meters per second squared. Well, so it's positive. Okay. Well, now I'm just um, indicating to you that it's only in the x. Sorry, only in the x. We've never done a problem where the force was enough to lift you off the ground. We haven't done that, so I'm not going to suddenly just throw that on your midterm. Oh, so the acceleration is to the right of this problem, but I should specify. Now, in the x direction, in the, before I go further and resolve this and write down other equations, in the x direction, let's write down what's going on. Max, step me through. What forces are acting to the left in the x direction? Um, uh, uh, oh, actually, the... Uh let him focus, guys. Come on. Friction force, good. And what's acting to the right in the x direction? What is that? F? Not ex. Px, right? It's fg minus fg. Okay. Force of pull in the x direction. So again, when the question asks you. That's what we're doing right now, though. We're just writing it as the x and the y direction separately. Okay, so look at your diagram. First, on the diagram, I see that there's FF acting to the left, and then I see that there's FBX acting to the right. There's nothing else acting horizontally in this entire problem. So that's it for the sum of the forces. But now, not three, but 20. So don't give me numbers, all variables right now. Come on. All equals. MA. Okay? Again, remember people, this, this governs both equations. Sum of the forces equals MA is in the X and the Y direction. If there's no acceleration, like you're noticing in the Y direction, then we just put a zero. So that's the easier part. But because in the X direction there was an acceleration of 3 meters per second squared, we have to write equals MAX. Now, at this point in time, all we can do is start writing things that we know. We know that the formula for the force of friction is mu Fn. So replace Ff with mu, and it's mu k because it's kinetic, it's moving, times Fn. We know that Fpx, this is your question now, Jeff. If you want to know the x component of a force, you always multiply the force times the cosine of theta. If you want to write this down, remember x implies cosine, y is always the sine. So we're going to write plus fp, and instead of putting an x there, we're just going to write cosine theta, and that equals max. Okay, and that equals max. I'm running out of room there if I can maybe slide these over. Alright. Now, continuing on the right hand side in the y direction, fg is always mg, and, but it's a negative, so we write negative mg. Fn is unknown. Remember, Fn you can only ever figure out by looking at what your answer is in the y. Fn is not equal to something else, so you're not going to replace that. You're going to leave Fn alone. But Fpy, you can just write Fp sine theta now. And this whole thing equals zero. So what we're going to notice is this. The goal of this problem is to figure out mu. Right? That's the goal. Find the kinetic uh, coefficient of friction. If I want to find mu, look at your x direction. You need Fn, you're given Fp, you're given cosine theta, you're given Max. 
So you're given all those values except for Fn. So that means in the y direction, what should we probably solve for? Fn. Again, let's take a look at this so we're all clear. In the x direction, you're given this. It's in the problem. You're given theta in the problem. You're given the mass. You're given the acceleration. You want to find mu k, so you need to know what Fn is. So go over to the y direction and say, OK, let me solve for Fn now. So move everything else over except for Fn. Max, when I do that, what do I get when I move everything else over and solve for Fn? Uh, I guess you get um, F minus F, or no, I guess it would be plus mg minus F piece in theta. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. That's, not, that's it. All right, so again. Fn is it is mg. Fn is only mg when an object is at rest. It has no vertical pull. But this one has a vertical pull, so it's not anymore. Okay? Again, remember, Fn equals mg only comes about when this happens. Ready? Watch. Next. If I cover this up, now what do you have? You have Fn equals mg, right? If I were to cover up Fp sine theta right here. So if I cover this value up, sorry, if I cover this value up for Fp sine theta, I'm going to have Fn equals mg. But Fp sine theta exists in this problem. There is a pull upward. So I can't just cover that up anymore. Okay? And a lot of you are making the assumption that Fn equals mg. Again, that only occurs when there's some sort of a constant force. Okay?
So I got the mu k by itself, because there was a negative in front of it. Remember that. Yeah. Okay, you can't forget your negative signs. So it's up to you to decide how you would like to proceed. If you want to plug in numbers earlier and try and solve, that's fine. Or solve generically, okay, and then plug in numbers at the very end. Wait, wait, wait. negative and this negative, correct. So if you, if you plug it earlier, yeah. sure, yeah. yep, absolutely. Yep. So what Jeff is noticing is that he ended up getting a negative value, I think, at one point. He got a negative, negative, to cancel. Don't worry about the numbers right now. It's the idea that you get and we're solving these, okay? Paul, I don't get how the, how do you get the value for FN? How do we get this up here? No, but numerically, like. Just plug in the numbers. You know the mass that was given. Oh, it's just G is negative 9.81. Okay? Sorry, G is 9.81. G is 9.81. Remember, G is only negative 9.81 with projectiles. Okay, G is a gravitational constant. Write that right down, please. And you'll see, on your formula sheet, you're going to see this. That's all you're going to see on your formula sheet for G. It's only going to be applied with the negative symbol when you're looking at projectile motion. Okay? Again, if I scroll up, I'll show you why. Watch. If I scroll up here, look earlier. Didn't we apply a negative to FG already right here? Because it was acting down. And this negative is already here. So if you put the negative and the negative, they're going to cancel, which doesn't make sense. Because the force of gravity has to act down. Okay? So this negative in front that I just circled here is already taking into account the negative value for G. So remember, write yourself a note. You're only going to use G as a negative with projectile motion. Projectile motion. Let's do another example on an inclined plane. Okay, with mu on an inclined plane. An object is at rest. On an inclined plane, with an angle of 60 degrees, the Determine the coefficient of static friction. Why is it static? Because it's good at rest. Now, write yourself a note, please, in the margin. Please write this down. If the problem said it was moving at a constant velocity, it would be identical as far as the solution goes. Because remember, if something's moving at a constant velocity, there's no acceleration. So our forces are still going to equal zero in the end. Okay, so write down a little note. If this object were moving at a constant velocity, it would be the exact same solution, but you'd be finding the kinetic friction coefficient. But it would be identical. The answer would not change. And I'll point that out again when we get into our equations. I mean, rather than at rest. Correct. Constant velocity, at rest, well, there's no velocity. difference actually at all in the answer. Well, any velocity. No. If it's moving with acceleration, then there is a difference in the answer. Well, well, yeah. yeah, we have to talk about that then. Do like you want to take a two-minute break? Yeah. yeah. Between, take okay. a two-minute break. I'll pause. So we start first. First we start with the diagram voice. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Draw your inclined plane. <laughs> Draw your object. 
Well, there's no mass, there's no nothing. I know, isn't that crazy? So what do you think is going to happen then in the equation? It's going to cancel out. It's going to cancel out. It better. He's got a problem, I'll tell you now. This is the example where you need to solve generically. Because I'm not going to give you a mass. So at one point in time, you're going to see the ends are going to drop off. And if you don't solve generically, you're going to be stuck. You're going to try and plug in numbers, but you're not going to have a mass to plug in. So let's go through this. First, here's what I know. And this is the tough part about inclined planes. Gravity acts down. Friction acts against motion. And the normal force acts perpendicular to the surface. Make sure you remember that. That was one of your multiple choice on your test. A lot of people screwed up. Normal force always acts perpendicular to the surface. Okay? Now, so you have those three forces. So it looks like you can start. You cannot start yet. What you need to do is remember to break up Fg into its components. And in this case, this is what you have. You have Fgx acting this way and Fgy acting this way. And then you can get rid of the Fg that was on there. Just like we broke up that force of pull into its components in the last example, we do the same thing here. But now we can see that, what are we doing? We're tilting our head like this. So you're tilting your head to the right about 30 degrees. Well, exactly 30 degrees, because it was 60 to complement. So tilt your head 30 degrees to the right, and that's what's going on. Your vertical, or your y direction, is now acting this way. That's the y direction. And this is really the x direction now. So okay. we split Fg into Fgy, Fgy, Fx? Correct. Need to? to do this, you have to, absolutely. You can't solve this problem another way. Okay? And if you're, if, you're, if you're really having trouble with this, I went over the whole derivation and where this all comes from in that video, the one that I sent out. And you'll see that it's on like section 4.4. Four, okay? It was a long video I did on forces and inclined planes. So I went over all this stuff. Okay? And I went over what Fgy means and Fgx means, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But if that's a little bit confusing still, please watch that video again. Yeah, um, how do you know that you, you're just FGX? Like, yeah, FGX yeah. Is the, the set of the FGX. Inclined planes, you always do that. It's just no, one no, of the things. No, because no, no. the reason is you need things to be only in the X and only in the Y. And since we're tilting our axes, it makes it a lot easier. Because the normal force is already along the Y axis. The force of friction is already along the X axis. So I can break up this FG into two components. If I drew my axis normal, then I would have to break up FF, and I would have to break up FN. Okay. So instead of wanting to break up two things, I can simply break up just FG. So it's whatever the axis. Yeah, it just makes it easier. Exactly. Right. Exactly right. what. So, so the x direction would be... Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, x direction. Go ahead. Guys, come on. Negative FF and the x, go ahead. Plus FGX equals zero. Very good. Exactly. And see how easy this is when you just simply look at the diagram now. Just look at it. FF is acting in the negative x. FGX is acting in the positive x. We said that it was stationary, so there's no MA. Again, our formula is always this. But there is no acceleration, so we put a zero on the right-hand side. Olivia, you got that part. Keep going. What about the y direction? Uh, Fn good. minus Fy equals zero. Very good. So now we have Fn acting up in the positive y direction. We've got FGY acting down, so we apply a negative sign of that, and that equals zero. Again, because the object has no acceleration. It is not moving. Now, let me go back to my statement from earlier. If this object were moving at a constant velocity, constant velocity implies zero acceleration still. So these would still be zeros on both sides. So that's why if an object moving at a constant velocity, you get the same answer because your equations are identical. Again, if it's moving with a constant velocity, this is still going to be a zero on the right-hand side. OK, it's still going to be a zero there because constant velocity implies no acceleration. But why wouldn't the kinetic friction be different in the side? Well, shouldn't the kinetic friction always be different in the side? Sure, it should be. And the value in this case You'll end up getting will be the same number, but what you'll notice is that the angle will have to be different. But it could be to get the object moving at a constant velocity, theta needs to be larger. That'll give us a different answer from human error. But the equations are the same for theta. You're going to see at the very end of this problem, I'll tell you now, the answer from you 
is the cos is the is the cosine of 90 minus theta over the sine of 90 minus theta? The answer is only a function of theta. So think about it in class. Remember we did that lab? When I looked at the desk, the object was stationary for a while, right? Then what happened? It started to slide. So while the object is stationary, it's going to be 60 degrees. But to get this object to start moving, it would have to be like 70 degrees. So that will change your answer by default, OK? So the generic solution is the same, but theta would be different for that scenario. So if the problem had said constant velocity, theta would have probably been like 70 degrees, OK? So let's go ahead and take a look now. Plug in what you know. The formula for FF is always mu FN. So start by plugging that in. Now, it's mu static times Fn. Okay, and notice I put the negative symbol. Okay, notice the negative symbol there. It carries down. Next, this is the part that was tricky and that I went over in that video. And there was a long derivation for this. Fgx is tough to remember. Remember what Fgx is here, Jeff? It's mg, but then you have to think about the x component. So that means that it's going to be cosine. Good. Theta. But when it's on an inclined plane, instead of theta. So it's like going like that, so it's probably negative 1 or 0. No. You're close, though. It is mg for fg, and it is cosine, but we don't use theta on an inclined plane. So really it is 60. It's not. Theta is 60. Oh, 90? Not 90. 90. 90 minus theta. There it is. Remember, you always use 90 minus theta. Wow. So if you're, I will really go over and take about 15 minutes. It's in that video. I'm happy to show you after school if you want, but you could just watch the video and I went over exactly what I would tell you. Okay. okay it's definitely there. I know I went over. I that. I just want to say it. Now, <laughs> that's the x direction, okay? That's the x direction right there. Notice, what is the goal? What are we solving for? What are we solving for, Jeff? Good. So we need Fn again, don't we? Yes. We still need Fn again. So let's go in the y direction. <laughs> what I'm going to do is, hold on one sec. I'm going to scroll down. So we get, can we, let, let's do this real quick. Hold on. All right, let's keep going with this. Sorry, because we're going to run out of room there. So go ahead, let, let's solve for Fn. Fn equals? How do I move it over? You add it. Good. But what's FGY? MA. Why? No, it's MG. Oh. Sine. Sine to it. Sine to it. Sine Good. You're joking. I'm joking. Okay, again, the Y component is always sine. We're on an inclined plane, so we use 90 minus theta. That's the generic solution for FN. And what you're going to notice is this. Miraculously, when we move this over now, everything's going to have an N in it. So what's going to happen to the ends? They cancel. They cancel. Wow. They cancel. Wow. cancel. So again, what am I doing? Just so we're all clear, we're taking this quantity, we're plugging it in right there for Fn. Okay, we're plugging it in right there for Fn, and this is what we're going to get. That's the solution we'll get at the bottom there when we plug that in. Okay. Um, can we do this? Can we subtract mu s into the other side, then for fn plug divide by fn and plug that in. Sure. Uh, don't even divide by for fn. Plug in mg sine 90 minus yep. theta plus mg. And that would be taking this whole term here, Jeff. That's negative, and thing. moving it over as a plot. It's the same thing. Yeah. The reason I do it this way is because now I'm noticing. I can technically factor out an M, or I could just move everything over and solve. You'll see the M's cancel. It doesn't matter either way. So let's move stuff around. Let's take this mu s mg sine 90 minus theta. Let's take this thing and move it over here now as a positive. Does that make sense? And move this over here as a negative now. Or at least, sorry, not as a negative. I'm sorry. This is what it looked like. I'm confusing people. I'm confusing right. myself. We want to take this value and add it to the right side of the equation. Okay? So we're going to add that entire thing, leaving us with mg cosine 90 minus theta equals positive mu s mg 
sine 90 minus theta divided by mg sine minus 90 minus theta. Good. So let's take this and divide. Okay. Divide the next quantity. I don't know about the whistle in there. All right, so we got mg cos 90 minus theta over mg sine 90 minus theta. And what did I tell you guys the answer was a minute ago? Cosine over sine. Mg is canceled. And that's the final solution. How's that going to do this? You just plug in. You have to do this. You can plug in, but Jeff, again, you don't know M, you don't know G. I mean, you know oh, G, it's yeah. 991, but you don't know the mass. Well, you can still cancel it out, right? Yes. If you're yes. at it, if you're at it. Oh, oh, gee. Absolutely. Oh. So could you memorize that? You could, technically, for this is always the solution. For me, that's true. Write this down if you want. This is always the solution for an inclined plane where the object is stationary or moving at a constant velocity. Again, when an object is stationary, or moving at a constant velocity on an inclined plane, this will always be the solution. Can you get this close on the test? Yeah. <laughs> so, please. Yeah, <laughs> That's what somebody said. I said, sure, but you never know. I can tell you now that there's a good chance it's not going to be moving at a constant velocity. So you'd have an acceleration involved in it, so there'd be an A somewhere in there. So and that might throw you off. This? It's just so Look at this magic one from Wilson. Why are you like trying to <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to do so we're reviewing something that we both obviously know that it's not going to be on the no, test. He knows, no, he this knows. will be on the test. No, 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 no. The acceleration with acceleration. This will be on the test, but with acceleration. This will teach you also. And that's all I do. Check for that. That was that was Jim's philosophy. No, if you give every other class. Here we go again. If you're going to waste your time studying right now, I know what you're about to say. Relax. Now. I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this, because this example, this example will probably be on your test, and there's a good chance that one with acceleration will also be on your test. If you want to try and memorize this, that's fine. That will help you on that one example. But when you get to that other example, you're going to be up the river without a paddle. Because he didn't teach it to us. No, because he didn't teach it to Look at your notes. Okay, good, we soon will be on the trolls. Look at your notes, guys. We did many examples with A. And let's go back and take a quick look. Because if you were a little patient and you were waiting for me, I would have followed up with this next thing I'm going to say. Had there, been, had there been acceleration, here's the difference, right? Let's go through it. It'll take us about three seconds. Watch. This becomes MAX. Okay? This becomes MAX. So this is now MAX. Okay? No, it's not. That's the y direction. Be careful. It's only the x direction. Okay, that's the vertical plane. So we have MAX now instead. Watch. Let's scroll down further. That means that this now becomes MAX. Okay? Again, it's the same exact problem, notice? But instead of a zero for the sum of the force in the x, it's now MAX. And what happens now, you'll notice, is that the mass is still canceled. These m's would all drop off like this. But you now have acceleration. So the only difference is that you would have, if we were to solve, you would have to have subtract. That's going to be over as a positive. This would have minus A at the end of it, and these G's would not drop off. That is why I don't want you to memorize that solution. Okay? Or else you have to memorize this whole solution then. Minus A. Okay? You don't want to memorize this stuff, guys. It's not worth it. It really isn't. Okay? Try and solve generically. Because you know what? If you memorize it and you happen to put sine over cosine, you're not going to get any points at all. You're going to get zero out of eight points, because this is an eight-point problem. Free response. Okay? Eight-point problem. Okay? It's very worthwhile. So I'm telling you that these kinds of problems will be on the test. You'll definitely have inclined planes, and there'll probably be multiple of them. Okay? So please keep that in mind. I might even make it a part A and B and say, part A, the object is moving at a constant velocity. Part B, now there's acceleration. So you know what all this work you just did? Because you saw them generically, you could just simply do what I just did and change all those things. And you have a whole other solution without redoing it twice. That's why it's important to solve this way. I see a lot of hands. Just going to go around. Yeah. So I 
I would move this over here, move this over here, so you'd end up getting a minus A next to the cosine. Sorry, so let me do this, guys. I apologize. Put the minus A up here. See, that's why I don't even memorize it. Don't memorize it, please. Okay, the minus A is up top, not on the bottom. I'm just not sure how it Move this over. What? Whenever is it in every term, it drops off. It's like you have know, the energy equations when they all add NGH or NGY. One F M B squared, one F M B F squared, all the F's cancel. It's like dividing the whole equation by M. Okay? Fernando. How would you ever find out if there's vertical acceleration? There won't be on an inclined plane. Uh, it's not. Oh, yeah. Because then it would have to be floating off the plane. And it wouldn't be an inclined plane problem. Is, like any, uh, is there any questions? No. Yeah, it's always going to be zero. When you have forces on inclined planes, <laughs> when you have forces on inclined planes, the vertical acceleration is going to be zero. Uh, it's at 100, but me. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go over the whole scale of it on Monday, you guys. I'll give you the exact amount of questions in each section and everything. So, so we'll definitely do that. For the, like, review sheet with all the problems, we'll the actual one. Teacher, the, like, I think that's the best. I hope it helps. I do. Yeah, some teachers say sure. that uh, there's no way of studying for our exams. So I you can just uh, read the questions. Let's keep going. All right, next problem. Next problem. Jeff, go. Um, Can you explain what would happen with the acceleration in the very what would happen to the acceleration if? Uh, if we had an acceleration going in the x and y direction, yeah, right there. So it just turned into mAx, and then mm -hmm. y is always zero because there's no vertical. Because that means the object will be floating, okay. right? But it wouldn't be mAx, it would be, well, it would be. Mass times acceleration in the x direction. Not, x is not a variable, yeah, it's yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's just. All right, let's, we got to keep going because we're going to run out of time for this. All right, let's do projectile motion next. This is definitely the next most important. Okay. An object is fired from ground level to a cliff that has a height. And I'm doing, just so you know, I'll do chapter three projectile. If we have time at the end today, I'll do a one dimensional. One dimensional is just when an object is like thrown straight up and straight down. This is the more complicated version. I'll do that first. Okay. An object is fired from ground level to a cliff that has a height of 100 meters. If, if the cliff or if the object is fired with a velocity of 25 meters per second, <coughs> then find the time it takes and the horizontal displacement. <coughs> And find the time it takes and the horizontal displacement. And you're going to notice that you're finding how many variables here? How many answers? Two. Time and horizontal displacement. I should give you an angle, by the way, sorry. Let's say it was fired at an angle of 30 degrees, please. Okay, so we're finding two things here. So how many equations must we have? Yeah, two variables, you need two equations. Just like the last example, we were missing us, we were also missing fn, really. That was our second unknown. Even though we didn't solve for fn, because we did it all algebraically, that was the second unknown variable in that last example. Okay? So what do we start by doing? Drawing a? Yeah, now there's no forces, but let's draw an image or a picture. Cliff. I love the clips. Wait, what's the angle? 30. 30. Okay, the height is 100 meters, the angle is 30, initial velocity of 25 meters per second. And that's all you know. What are you trying to find again? The time and the? And the x. Good, the horizontal displacement. So we are looking for x. We know the y value. 
we know vi, we know theta, and we also want to find t. So this diagram is already listing almost all my givens for me. Does everybody see that? Now, what is the acceleration in the y direction for projectiles always going to be? Uh, gravity. Gravity, good. Which is? Oh, uh, negative 9.81. Wait, okay. I have a question. Don't confuse with forces, Jim. Is v f 0 or do you just smoke? It's not, and we're not going to care about it. Okay. The thing is, people kept trying to think it's 0 because, oh, it li lands on the cliff and stops, right? right but that's because of the force the cliff applies and the impulse and stuff. Uh, but you, you don't even care about vf in this problem, okay? okay? Uh, but again, the acceleration in the y direction is always negative 9.81 meters per second squared with projectiles. OK, and then the x jeff is? Good. Remember, there's no acceleration in the x direction ever. If there ever were acceleration in the x direction, it wouldn't be that much tougher, but then it would involve air resistance, OK? You'd have to think about the air resistance and the force that it would apply. So, before we go on to continue this problem, I want to write our givens now, but I want to point out a few things. Just by looking at the diagram right away. First, the object is traveling from the ground level to a cliff. So it's moving in the vertical direction positively. So y is positive 100. What if I had shot this object off the cliff to the ground level? Y would be negative 100. Is that clear? What if I launched it from the ground and it landed on the ground. What is the y value then? Zero. Zero. Again, if you start at ground level and you launch it and it goes all this range, this horizontal distance, but it still lands on the ground, then the y value is zero there. Those are some key things you should know. Because certain problems are going to start at ground level and end at ground level. Others might start at a cliff and in the ground, or start at the ground and in the cliff. You got to know the y value. That's the big key with these, OK? So when you said, uh Exactly, exactly. Del and that's what this is. This y that we always list is delta y. That's exactly right. Okay. Stop. Well, there two x values, and you just choose For the range, there's not going to be two x values here, but the problem you're thinking of where there's two solutions is when you solve for theta. And one answer is 30, and the other answer is 60. They're always complementary. That's where you get multiple solutions. You'll get two answers for time here. Okay, but couldn't, um, uh, wouldn't it reach 100 meters twice because first it's going up and then when it's landing? Oh, I see what you're saying, Sash. Um, yeah, yep, yeah, absolutely. So what Sash is saying is this. What if, that, what if this happens, guys? Ready? What if the projectile gets launched, watch, it hits, it would like hit the cliff, but it would kind of pass it and then come back down, right? It reaches 100 meters right here, but it's also going to reach 100 meters right here. So you, the reason is, your answer for time we're going to get is going to be two answers. So plugging in those two answers for time, you'll end up getting two answers for your x value. Now, if it says on the way up, you use the lower value of time, which would be the lower value of x. That's this value right here. If it says on the way down, then you would use this value over here. Good point, Stash. Very good. All right, so what we want to do here is list our x and y components again. So in the x direction and in the y direction. So I want to first list my v, i, x. And then I want to list my v, i, y. I want to realize I'm looking for the x component. I know the acceleration in the x. I'm also looking for the time. In the y, I know the y component. I know the acceleration in the y. I'm also looking for the time. So these are the things that you're really always going to list here. Okay? Whenever it's a projectile motion, there's a good chance these four are going to be listed on each side. This is 0, so we don't have to worry about acceleration. Unknown, 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 negative 9.81 meters per second squared. It goes up 100 meters. The question becomes v i y and v i x. Jack. Yeah. But then what do you put after that? Good. So this is cosine 30, and this is sine 30. Remember that was in 30 the angle given? Yeah. Theta, T, T, H. 
theta was given as 30 degrees. So to know the x component, to know the x component, we simply use cosine 30 and the y sine 30. Now, the units are meters per second for both, by the way. Here's what we want to do next. We want to think about our equations. Whenever it's a projectile motion, there's a good chance in the y direction you use one equation. We seem to use that equation a lot. Good. VI, VIYT. One half. AY, T squared. Now, remember, on your formula sheet, this doesn't look like that. Actually, it does. It's, it's, a, it it's, it's not the same. It says x equals, and it says vit, and one half at squared. All these y's are missing. So remember, this formula is given to you, but you need to adapt it to the situation that you're involved in. So you put the y's in those places instead of the x's, like the formula sheet gives. Check. Uh, I was a little confused because when I remember studying mm -hmm. um, the y, I used that a equals x over t, and then substitute the t. In the in the y direction, there's acceleration, so you have to use this formula. I did. Okay. So then I switched. Acceleration equals x over t can really be t equals x. Except what acceleration doesn't equal x over t though. Yeah, let's change. That's where you're confused. Velocity. Oh, velocity over t. <laughs> velocity over time. Oh wait, that's simply you can still do that though. But you know why? Yeah, delta d. I would, I would okay. Okay. Yeah, you can still do that though. Well, you don't know the change in velocity, so it's not going to help you. You would need to know the final velocity, and we don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. Just swallow off for a second. The, the idea is there, John. I like what you're saying, thinking about substituting to help you. But it's not going to help you much. You know A. A is negative 9.81. So there's no need to solve it for it, okay? okay. Or plug in for it. Now, in the x direction, if there's no acceleration, then see this portion of the equation I'm holding right now? Look at my hand. I'm covering in the x direction. This portion doesn't even matter. Okay, it's zero because there's no acceleration. So in the x direction, the formula is just x equals v i x times t. And we've wrote that equation many times. But in class, in class we wrote it like this. In class we wrote it as v i x or v bar x equals x over t. Remember we kept writing it like that in class? It's the same thing as the first portion of the y equation. If you were to move the t over, watch. Take the t and move it up. You get vix times t equals x. That's this first, first part of the equation. It's the same thing. Okay, so you can either use this, what we're showing you right here, for the x direction, because remember, this is velocity with no acceleration. This is the first formula I think that we went over for the entire year. Yeah, it's your first formula on test one. It says v equals delta x over delta t. That's what this is. And V, even though it says VIX, is constant. Why is VIX constant? Why is the velocity not going to change? Exactly. When the acceleration is zero, this is constant. And that's why in class we did this. We put a bar over the top, which means constant. And that's only because there's no acceleration. So feel free to write it that way. Or you could just simply write the beginning of the Y equation over in the X terms. It's the same thing. Because you're going to move the t up anyhow. And that's the thing. So the x direction isn't doing anything for me yet. So we got to move on to the y direction. And that's what I was going to point out. Now I just noticed, take a look. We don't know x. We don't know t. We don't know either of these. So we cannot solve over here. So let's try and find the time in the y direction. Because it's missing, right, in two spots. It's a quadratic. Let's try and find the time and figure it out to move it over here. Okay, Jeff. Wait a uh, that, don't we do, we have the acceleration in the y direction. Correct. It'll be zero. It's not zero. We do have it in the y direction, uh, but in the x it was zero. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's plug in. 100 equals 25 sine 30, that's the VIY, times t. Now, 1 half at squared, half of 9.81. 4.9. 4.905. I'm going to write it as a minus because it's going to be a negative. And if you know now what you've done, I know that for a fact, you're 
algebra 2, you better have the quadratic formula memorized at this point. I gave it to you in the beginning of the year, but you should know it at this point. Okay? Let's put it in order first. Let's put it in order. I'm going to put the t squared at the beginning. And I'm going to put plus. You can type it in your calculator. I'm not going to, I mean, I can't stop you from doing that, guys, but you should have it memorized by now anyway. Okay? Sorry, let me just break this so it looks better. There we go. Okay? So moving the 100 over and putting it in standard quadratic form, that's what it looks like. This is A, this is B, this is C. Okay, this is C. This is by far the most complicated problem you're going to have for projectile if you have to use a quadratic formula. There's a good chance on the test that I might make it so that it's a little bit easier so you don't need the quadratic formula. Okay? Oh, thank you. So, just giving you a heads up. Now, if we were to, can I borrow a calculator real quick? I'm going to grab it. I'm going to grab it. I'm going to do this one. That's why. No. Times absolute value of x times cosine theta 
because this is our formula for work. Remember, work equals Fx times cos theta times x. So the work done by friction would be this. So that's what we put in there in the past. Okay? What I want to do on Wednesday is to quickly do a few examples of energy. We didn't get that yet. We did projectiles, forces, 1D motion. There are examples of projectiles that are like launched up and down only, or an object moving left and right only. It's a simpler version of projectiles. You should probably just look at your notes for these examples of chapter 2. But what I want to do on Wednesday is go over an example from chapter 5, and then move on to, again, momentum and centripetal motion. Okay? So we have a lot to do on Wednesday, so make sure you're well prepared. Okay, good job, guys.